a deep dive into Silicon Valley's early years, highlighting the people behind the celebrity founders and CEOs. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Leslie Berlin, Silicon Valley historian at Stanford and author of Troublemakers, Silicon Valley's Coming of Age. Welcome, Leslie. Thanks a lot, Tanya. Give us a brief summary of your resume, if you will. Golly, I've been studying Silicon Valley since the mid-1990s when I wrote a dissertation um, then a book about Bob Noyce, who co-founded Intel and Fairchild and co-invented the microchip and mentored important entrepreneurs, among them Steve Jobs. I've worked at Stanford since I got my PhD, and uh, my most recent book is called Troublemakers, Silicon Valley's Coming of Age, which really looks at this incredible big, big bang moment in the late 60s and through the 70s. And you had five major industries come up within the space of eight years and about 30 miles. It's just incredible. What motivated you to write it? You know, my first book was a biography, and I loved that. And the whole time I was re writing it, I thought, you know, he would be the first person to say that he didn't do any of this himself. And what I wanted this time was to be able to tell the story about all of the other people who are just outside that spotlight that tends to shine on a few celebrity entrepreneurs. And those are the people who really make it happen. And any celebrity entrepreneur who tells you differently is just not understanding how things work in Silicon Valley. To your point, Troublemakers is a deep dive into Silicon Valley's early years, highlighting the pioneers that launched five defining technology industries of today. How did you select the pioneers to cover and what was your process? I had a few criteria for this. Uh, one, the people had to be just interesting in their own right. So that to me, nobody wants to read a history of a technology as much as they want to be told a story. So the person had to be interesting, but they also had to be really important. So for example, the person who it turns out was a, a master's degree in psychology running the lab with the highest concentration of PhDs, top-notch computer scientists in the country um, at Xerox Park. That uh, same guy was the guy who convinced the Department of Defense to start the internet. And then he ran this lab at Xerox Park. So incredibly interesting guy, incredibly important. And then the last thing, my criteria was that they had to be unknown. I wanted people whose work was so important, but they weren't well known. So for example, this guy named Mike Markula, he was the third founder of Apple. He owned a third of the company with Jobs and Wozniak. He's the guy who took that from a little garage operation into the youngest company ever to make the Fortune 500. And almost no one had ever heard of him. This was definitely a remarkably inventive and creative time. As a historian, what made this time, this time in our history so unrivaled? And are there any comparisons in history? I think that what made this really special was this is when Silicon Valley moved from being sort of gearhead to gearhead sales into consumer electronics, into sales for the rest of us. And if you really see the branching out, you've got the birth of personal computers, for example, or video games, things that, whereas before these had just been one engineer selling a chip that was going to be buried deep inside the technology. Uh, you know, in some ways, and I, I know it's a kind of silly analogy, but I have thought that there, this sort of concentration of innovation, it's not unfair to compare it uh, to Renaissance Italy. The first thing that Steve Jobs did when he was fired from Apple was to call Bob Noyce, and, the subject actually you mentioned of your first book, and David Packard. What was the backstory there? Yeah, uh, he called them and apologized for what he called dropping the baton. He had this idea of there being a generational handoff, this relay race across time. So Packard starts HP, and then sort of the next generation comes along, and that's Noyce and Intel. And then the next generation comes along, and Jobs saw himself as part of that, of course, with Apple. 
And then he never really talked about it, but he mentored and helped young entrepreneurs himself, people like Mark Zuckerberg, people like the founders of Google. And actually, for my money, this sort of generational handoff is one of the two unknown secrets to Silicon Valley's success, this notion of giving back um, by helping the next generation up. The, the second one, uh, second secret, is the importance of immigrants to the Valley. That was true then, and it's true now when uh, two thirds of the people working in science and tech in Silicon Valley were born outside of the country. There were two women featured in your book. What brought Fawn Alvarez Talbot to your attention? So Fawn Alvarez Talbot, one of, uh, it's impossible to choose who's my favorite in my book, but she's gotta be one of them. She uh, was, of interest to me because she worked in manufacturing. People don't know this, but Silicon Valley used to be a manufacturing economy. And her job was actually on an assembly line at Rome, literally putting together the technology. And I really wanted to talk about that. Um, it's, a, it's a lost time. It's a time when there were factory jobs that enabled people to buy houses without a college degree. I mean, her mom did the same thing without a high school degree. I really wanted to talk about uh, the changes that have hit the Valley. And the way she came to my attention was my first book uh, got a lot of attention um, and good feelings from the leaders of the tech community. And someone who'd been instrumental at Rome uh, said, if you ever need any help, let me know. So I contacted that person and said, can you think of anyone um, who would be great and that person said, oh, yes, I can, um, pointed me towards Fawn, did an introduction, and that was just a great fit. The other woman you mentioned in your book, Sandy Kurtzig, she had a real struggle with people understanding her contribution. What was it like being a woman at that time in a boys club? Yeah, Sandy was actually an outsider in two ways. Of course, she was a woman at a time where it was so uncommon for a woman to be in a Silicon Valley company, much less running one. The people thought she was a booth babe. People asked her to bring coffee. It was just you know, incredible, it was so unusual. She was also an outsider, and this actually was my main reason for wanting to include her, because she sold software at a time when Silicon Valley was all about hardware, at a time when Larry Ellison talks about getting kicked out of venture capitalists' offices for the whole notion of selling something as completely impossible to understand as software was at that time. And so Sandy being this double outsider, a woman selling software, quite literally when she told people she told she sold software, they thought she was in the lingerie business. In your opinion, what have what lessons have the king pins of Silicon Valley learned since the beginning? And what, if any, lessons still need their attention? Well, it, it's funny. I think that the, the spirit of Silicon Valley has really been a lot um, in this sort of troublemaking uh, that I've described. And I think this notion of um, not being constrained in your thinking is a really important inheritance up to now. I think that it has gotten a bit warped in some cases, not all. I still think overall Silicon Valley is, is an incredible, wonderful place. I think that when the kind of audacity that you need in order to innovate on a high level becomes arrogance and the sense that the rules shouldn't apply to you, that's where the trouble kicks in. Leslie Berlin, Silicon Valley historian at Stanford and author of Troublemakers, Silicon Valley's Coming of Age. You know, Leslie, this is actually several books in one and it's a great read. If somebody wants to pick up a copy, maybe they want to connect with you and get more of your insight. How can they do that? Twitter is great. I'm at Leslie Berlin SV for Silicon Valley and the book's available anywhere online at Amazon, any bookstore you walk into. Thanks again for your time, Leslie. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or go to my website, tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.